Two new portraits now line the walls of the White House. Today, the portraits of former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama were unveiled. And with them, a message of hope to the next generation. When future generations walk these halls and look up at these portraits, I hope they get a better, honest sense of who Michelle and I were. And I hope they leave with a deeper understanding that if we could make it here, maybe they can too. Wildfires force thousands from their homes as a hurricane closes in on the East Coast. Our Ginger Z is tracking it all. An investigative reporter in Las Vegas murdered outside his home. Investigators believe being a journalist played a role as they now examine new video that shows a suspect potentially in disguise. My name is Missy Mendo. I am from Littleton, Colorado. I am a Columbine High School survivor. My name is Mia Tretta. When I was 15, I was shot in the Saugus High School shooting. Bound by tragedy, connected by grief. Survivors and loved ones in mourning from mass shootings come together in a club focused on their journey to healing. Controversy in Columbus. Officers shoot a 20-year-old man in bed. Now an investigation into what happened is underway. Tonight, Donovan Lewis's mother opens up to us about her loss. I made it to the scene while they were still in the early stages, and they would not give me any information at all. I knew, I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, and so I had to see for myself. Reinventing the fashion world and blazing a runway for others while doing so, my conversation with the first gay black editor-in-chief of British Vogue, whose Ghanaian roots helped to fuel his passion. I wanted every woman to see themselves in the pages of Vogue. I always grew up with the line, if you can see it, you can be it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the extreme fire danger and record heat on the West Coast and a near power disaster averted. Tonight, California's governor is calling the never before seen prolonged September heat a wake up call on climate change. The record highs span from California to Idaho, 116 degrees in Sacramento, 109 in San Jose. 57 million Americans are now under alerts tonight for excessive heat. Officials in California are crediting an emergency alert asking Californians to conserve power that helped avoid widespread blackouts Tuesday night that could have crippled the power grid. And California is just now entering peak fire season and firefighters are on the front lines of 14 wildfires in that state alone. The Fairview fire in Southern California has doubled in size in 24 hours, forcing thousands from their homes. At least two people died trying to escape the flames in their car. And in Northern California, near Lake Tahoe, firefighters there are battling the mosquito fire in very steep terrain and threatening homes. And tonight, Hurricane Kay is barreling toward the Pacific Coast. What impact will it have? Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, is standing by from California. But first, Will Carr leads us off from the fire lines. Tonight, thousands of firefighters battling flames spreading in record-breaking heat across the state of California. In Riverside County, east of Los Angeles, the Fairview fire doubling in size in just 24 hours. You can hear the planes overhead. With that thick plume of smoke growing, the fire already raced through this canyon, destroying everything in its path. The fire already claiming two lives. Authorities believe that people died in their car trying to escape. North of here, the Radford fire also out of control. This is what is saving Big Bear. It's the DC-10s and the tankers dropping the retardant nonstop. The fire's driven by drought in an unprecedented heat wave that's now in its eighth day, straining the state's power grid to its absolute limits, rolling blackouts a threat. In the Central Valley, several Fresno Unified schools having issues with their air conditioning, one even dismissing early Tuesday. I could not focus. I took like probably like 10 minutes to like think for like a couple problems. And in the Phoenix area, authorities rescuing multiple hikers in the extreme heat. Tragically, 32-year-old Evan Deshawn did not survive. I would just ask people to please be careful on the trails. He leaves behind a wife and infant daughter. Experts say prolonged, record-breaking heat waves like we're seeing in the West are becoming the new normal. Longer, hotter summers around the world thanks to our warming climate. Things have changed. Mother Nature's fury is now here and it's present. 
Will Carr joins us now from near the Fairview Fire Lines in Southern California. Will, while the power grid did hold last night, how much concern is there still about the tonight and, and the days ahead? Lindsay, there's real concern, and as that smoke is billowing behind me, uh, we know scorching temperatures are going to continue to fuel these fires and to challenge the power grid through the rest of the week. Tonight, authorities here in California are begging for consumers to conserve their energy to avoid rolling blackouts. Lindsay. All right. Will Carr, our thanks to you. Now let's bring in our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, in Anaheim, California, who is tracking it all. Hey, Ginger. Oh, we are baking here in Southern California. That's for sure, Lindsay. I do also want to mention Salt Lake City, for example, broke their all-time September record just yesterday at 105. They today are already at 107, which ties an all-time heat record for any month. This is a really big heat wave, and we are kind of at the crux of it. It's going to go down from here, but we've got 14 states that are on alert with some sort of fire or heat advisory excessive heat warning still in place from southern Nevada right here in California. Well, what's going to happen is there are a couple of things going to come down. A cold front for the Pacific Northwest that will move through the Rockies, but then down here, we're going to see those numbers from 100, 101 on Friday in Los Angeles drop below 80 for the weekend. Some of that is going to come from moisture and cloud cover from a now Hurricane K that will be dwindling to a tropical storm, but close enough to land here where we could see some of those outer bands and certainly the cloud cover from it build moisture into Southern California, which we desperately need here. But what's going to happen on top of this is in some of those Palm Springs or Mount Laguna, uh, El Centro, you could end up with three to five inches of rain falling really quickly. And we know what happens when that comes down. Flash flood threat goes up. Lindsay? Uh, lots of concern there. Ginger, our thanks to you as always. Now to breaking news just in from Canada. After a wide-scale manhunt for several days, authorities finally have their suspect in custody. They believe that he and his brother stabbed and killed 10 people with 18 more injured, many of the victims from the same family. Let's bring in ABC's Marcus Moore, who's in Saskatoon. Marcus, what's the latest? Well, Lindsay, this is a major development that people have been waiting uh, for, for four days now. Uh, police here in Canada are saying that 30-year-old Miles Sanderson uh, was just captured in the town of Roston, Saskatchewan. That's about 45 minutes northeast of where we are right now. He was apparently in a car that had been reported stolen just this afternoon. So all of this has developed very quickly. We don't have a lot of details on how he was taken into custody, but we are hearing from police here in Canada that he is no longer a threat. And, and as you mentioned, so many people have been on edge in the, on edge in the midst of this four-day search that has spanned across the entire uh, province here and in Western Canada where authorities didn't know where Sanderson was. They also, in the course of their investigation and search, found his 31-year-old brother, Damien, uh, dead on Monday morning. Police saying that his injuries were not believed to be self-inflicted. And after that, they continued to search. And here we are today with this latest development. Uh, these two brothers accused of stabbing 10 people to death and injuring 18 others. And Lindsay, uh, there are 10 people still in the hospital right now, three of them in critical condition, recovering from their injuries in the, as a result of this stabbing rampage. Uh, there's still been no word on a motive, but again, police today saying that these brothers, these suspects in this stabbing rampage are no longer a threat to the community here. I'm Lindsay. sure so many are relieved. Marcus, our thanks to you. Back here in the U.S., we're learning new details about the brutal and mysterious death of a well-known Vegas investigative reporter. It happened right outside of his home where sources say warrants were executed. And tonight we're seeing video of a suspect and the suspect's car. ABC's Alex Perche has more. Tonight, we're learning authorities in Las Vegas have executed search warrants in the fatal stabbing of a well-known Las Vegas reporter. Our victim uh, comes outside and has uh, encounters the suspect. There's an altercation that occurs, and uh, we believe that at that time the suspect stabbed and killed uh, the victim. Jeff Gearman, an investigative reporter for the Las Vegas Review-Journal, was found dead outside his home around 10.30 a.m. on Saturday, according to police. Tonight, a source telling ABC News those search warrants included the home of Clark County Public Administrator Robert Tellis, 
TELUS, the subject of several articles written by Garabin. On Tuesday, authorities releasing this new video of a suspect, saying it appeared the person may have been casing the area to commit a crime, as well as new photos of the suspected killer's vehicle. And tonight, a source says the police now believe the suspect was dressed up to look like a member of a known burglary ring and did not belong to the group. Everyone, I think, is united in our community from the media to the police to the public to try to solve this crime as quickly as possible. Alex Perche, thank you. Lawmakers are now back on Capitol Hill following their summer recess, and they're reacting to the latest developments about the classified documents the FBI retrieved from Mar-a-Lago. But Republicans are not saying much. For more, let's bring in ABC's congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Rachel, you checked in with several Republicans today to try to get their reactions to former President Trump's handling of classified material. What did they tell you? Well, Lindsay, I could tell you that most Senate Republicans that we spoke to today did not want to talk about this. Look, the reality is, is we are less than 70 days out from the midterm elections. They want to focus on inflation. They want to focus on the economy. They want to focus on winning back both the House and the Senate. They don't want to talk about this controversy surrounding the former president. But I put the question to several Republicans today asking whether or not the former president mishandled those classified documents. Take a listen. I, I don't really have any comments on this this whole in, investigation that's been dominating the news for the last month. I think we're following it like all of you are. It, it does not appear that everything was done quite appropriately, um, but I have not really uh, delved into the details of this. I'm not saying I'm not concerned about the whole situation. I'm just saying I don't have the facts. Lots of pivoting there, dodging the questions. Uh, several Republicans today said that they wanted to see more facts come out here. Obviously, we have learned a lot more information in recent weeks while Congress has been on recess, but they are walking this fine line, not really offering a complete and total defense of the former president, but not willing to criticize him either, Lindsay. They're playing a little bit of dodgeball there. Meanwhile, some Republicans are trying to put the focus on the Justice Department and FBI and whether the investigation has been politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that argument? Yeah, that was an interesting turn that we heard today as well from Senator Josh Hawley and also uh, Senator Kennedy trying to change the subject, trying to say that this is about politicizing the FBI, the Department of Justice. Uh, Senator Josh Hawley also telling me that the biggest concern for him is that the FBI would raid the home of a possible presidential nominee in 2024. They say they have big questions about this. But again, when it comes to just basic questions about whether or not it was appropriate for a former president of the United States to take those classified documents to a private residence to store them the way that he did, we could not get a firm answer from anyone other than Senator Mitt Romney, who said that that does raise some serious concerns, Lindsay. Rachel Scott for us from the White House. Thanks so much, Rachel. Here in New York, longtime Trump ally Steve Bannon is expected to surrender to authorities tomorrow. State prosecutors say that Bannon built donors for cash in an online We Build the Wall fundraising campaign. He was pardoned on similar federal charges the day the former president left office. And just like before, Bannon says he won't go down without a fight. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, Donald Trump's former advisor, Steve Bannon, preparing to surrender to law enforcement authorities here in New York. Bannon expected to face new charges in connection with a group called We Build the Wall, which raised $25 million to build a section of President Trump's border wall, much of that money coming from small donors. They see that this is a way uh, that they can take action to actually, you know, make happen a physical barrier on the southern border and support President Trump and what President Trump's trying to do. The group promised each donor an actual brick in the wall with their name on it. You're not going to last forever, but your brick will. Organizers pledging every penny raised would go towards construction. 100% of your money goes towards the wall. It's not going to line someone's pocket. But it wasn't true. In 2020, the Justice Department charged Bannon and three colleagues with pocketing hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations, spending it on themselves. But before Bannon's trial could even begin, President Trump threw him a lifeline, pardoning him on his very last day in office. Bannon's associates weren't so lucky. Two are facing years in prison after pleading guilty to wire fraud and conspiracy, and the third will soon be going on trial. And let's get right to Ariel Reshef, who's outside of the courthouse in Lower Manhattan for us tonight. Ariel, that presidential pardon doesn't protect Bannon from state prosecution? That's right, Lindsay. And prosecutors believe that there are victims here in New York who deserve justice. Bannon calling this a political weaponization of the criminal justice system, saying, I have not yet begun to fight. Lindsay. All right, Ariel Reshef, our thanks to you. 
We head overseas now to the war in Ukraine as that country's troops extend their counteroffensive strategy. Meanwhile, Putin defiantly tells the world Russia has not and will not lose anything. Here's ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge. Tonight, Russia's vicious assault on Kharkiv in the northeast relentless. But in the countryside outside the city, Ukraine pushing forward. A military official sharing footage he says shows abandoned Russian positions and equipment. Ukrainian forces showing us how they are able to pinpoint Russian positions using armed reconnaissance drones. Well, we step right back here because they've mounted a grenade onto the drone. You can see the grenade going. You can see how drones are now being used as weapons. In addition to this new counteroffensive, there remains grave concern about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. These new images revealing more damage from shelling. And now officials from the UN's nuclear watchdog report the plant has lost a crucial backup power line. President Zelensky telling David Russia is now using the plant essentially as a nuclear weapon. You see, they occupied it, our nuclear station. Six blocks, the biggest in the Europe. It means six Chernobyls. It means the biggest danger in the Europe. So they occupied it. So that is, means that they used nuclear weapon. That is nuclear weapon. Facing mounting losses, Vladimir Putin today defiant, insisting we have not lost anything and we will not lose anything. Tom joins us now. Tom, given all that's going on, how's morale right now with the Ukrainians? I think your morale is the highest it's been in a long time uh, here in Ukraine, not only the Ukrainian people, but also Ukrainian troops. President Zelensky tonight confirming, Lindsay, that Ukraine has recaptured several settlements from Russia, calling it good news. His forces really now seem to have the initiative in this war. And tomorrow, Secretary of Defense Austin will meet with more than 50 allied nations in Germany. U.S. officials saying they'll discuss longer term support for Ukraine. Lindsay. All right, Tom in Ukraine for us once again tonight. Thanks so much, Tom. World News Tonight anchor David Muir sat down with Ukrainian President Zelensky for an exclusive interview, saw a snippet of it there. He returned to a question from the early days of the war. Did he take the U.S. warnings of a potential Russian invasion seriously enough? We're now more than six months into this war. As you know, many people have now looked back to the months leading up to the invasion. Many have pointed to U.S. intelligence, to the Biden administration uh, repeatedly telling you that a large scale invasion was possible. Do you have any regret that you didn't tell the Ukrainian people earlier about what could be coming? So some people were saying, yes, they will come. Others were saying, no, they will come. They were disunited. The European leaders were saying, Putin gave us his word that he's not going to invade. Nobody knew for sure for sure, 100%. What scale of invasion uh, was there to be expected? No one knew that those Russian troops will kill, maim, rape people and just erase our cities to the ground. I asked all the intelligence, show us what concrete directions give us more weapons. But then they said, if they begin invasion, we give you more weapons. You believe that the U.S. could have provided you with more military help before the invasion based on the intelligence they were trying to signal to you. I think it's not just the United States. I think it's the whole world. We can not only put any blame on the United States, that the United States should have provided us with everything. The whole world wasn't 100% sure that they will start this invasion. Our thanks to David. President Zelensky's plea for help from the U.S. and other nations remains unchanged. You can see the entire wide-ranging interview with Zelensky tonight here on ABC News Live and later on Hulu in our special, The Zelensky Interview, No Compromise. And when we come back, a chilling new video of the suspect walking into a store and opening fire. He arrived in London as a refugee and is now the editor-in-chief of British Vogue, pushing for inclusion and profiling big-name celebrities. Now Edward Enninful is telling his own 
own story. But up next, the calls for justice from a family after a man is shot and killed by police while in his own bed. I speak exclusively to the mother of Donovan Lewis about the police department's version of events and the legal action the family is now planning to take. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Passengers were left in the dark at Austin's airport in Texas this morning. Departing flights were halted and security checkpoints were offline. Some who were already waiting inside the airport were seen eating in the dark as they waited for flights to start taking off again. Officials believe an underground equipment malfunction caused the outage. Electricity was restored several hours later. Now to the controversy in Columbus, Ohio, over a deadly police shooting. Columbus officials say that officers showed up at Donovan Lewis's apartment around 2 a.m. on August 30th to arrest him on several charges. Body camera video shows officers identifying themselves at the door and then two people leaving. Officers then enter with a canine and open a bedroom door, spotting 20-year-old Donovan Lewis sitting up in his bed and raising his hands. Officer Ricky Anderson appears to open fire almost immediately, firing a single shot. The Columbus police chief says it appears Lewis was holding something in his hand, but no weapon was found at the scene, just a vape pen. Officer Anderson is on paid leave pending an investigation. Lewis's mother, Rebecca Duran, and the family's attorney, Rex Elliott, are joining us now exclusively tonight on ABC News Live Prime. Uh, thank you both for being here. And, and Ms. Duran, we want to obviously extend our, our condolences uh, to you, and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. We just went through the police department's explanation about what happened, including the second that it took for an officer to fire his gun killing your son. What's your response to their version of events? There is 
things that are absolutely untrue. The, um, and, and when you watch the, the, the complete video, it's, it's obvious. Um, the person that, the, the officer that shot him, it, it, it also in the video, it's absolutely obvious that he could not see him. He was partially behind the door and when he went to go shoot him, um, the person who had a, a, a clear view did, did not fire. So there's obviously something very, very, very wrong. Um, I mean, that there's so much more. I, the fact that there was a delay of care, that there was no attempt to to to, to, pre to preserve his life, um, frisking him handcuffed, flipping him around on the bed. I work in healthcare, like there was no pressure applied to wounds. Uh, he should have been treated immediately in that room. You saw the video, uh, apparently. Did you watch it immediately? I know that, that some mothers in the situation decide to not ever watch. Was there something that, that compelled you that, that you had to see his final moments? I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, and so I had to see for myself. I have not watched the entire video. Um, I have seen snippets. Um, trusted friends have sent me pieces and parts that none of it is okay, but that I don't have to see the worst treatment of him. I mean, there were six minutes that passed from the moment he was shot before first aid, the first attempt at any kind of aid was given. He was gone. Um, seeing when they said he was resisting, re re resi I'm so sorry, I've not been sleeping. Oh, we resi understand. Please don't apologize. Resisting arrest, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, he was limp. He, 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 his own body weight is what they were fighting against. Not, he was no muscular contraction in there. I mean, it was his own body weight. If he was able to speak, he would have said something, help me something. Um, I'm smiling just because I'm thinking about how he talked. Mm -hmm. But if he was capable of talking, he would have. Mm -hmm. In cases like this, people are often remembered for how they died. I'm curious how you want people to remember Donovan for how he lived. He lived life grand. I mean, um, he loved life. He had a zest for life. He loved people. He had the biggest heart. Um, the people that have reached out to me, uh, teachers, coaches, a host of, of people throughout his life, his friends, um, all talk about his, his awesome sense of humor, his awesome smile, his beautiful eyelashes, you know, um, how much he cared about those were around him. Uh, Mr. Elliott, uh, officers are saying that they waited several minutes at the front door and the bedroom door before entering. There's also their assertion that the officer believed that he was armed. From a legal standpoint, what do you think that officers could or should have done instead? Well, we first have to start with the fact that this arrest warrant was served in the middle of the night, which is a massive problem. There was no reason to serve this in the middle of the night and create the chaos that they did. Secondly, there was no reason for an attack dog to be in that apartment. The other two residents in the apartment in the apartment came to the door and let the officers in. Additionally, Donovan was in the back of the apartment. There's no indication that he heard anybody at the front door. And the, the reality is that this police officer opened the door and within a split second, he didn't have the time to perceive anything in Donovan's hand. Uh, Donovan, from the videos, uh, his hands were down to, at his side. Th these police officers were screaming at him to come out of the room. He's getting out of bed like they are asking him to do. He's following police commands when he is gunned down in cold blood. There was no indication on this video uh, that there was anything in his hand or any reason for this officer to use deadly force. You're filing a civil case against the city and Officer Anderson on behalf of the family. Can you tell us anything about the allegations that it might entail? Yeah, absolutely. It's a civil rights violation. It's a it's a it's excessive force. They used deadly force in a situation where deadly force was not called for. It was a reckless shooting. And we just heard Mr. Elliott say too many unarmed black kids. Mr. Rand, do you feel that that race played a role here? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, Donovan himself, uh, he wrote some journals that uh, at a later date, I'll, I'll release them. He, in his own words, he was very, very adamant that people of color, he, he stressed that people of color, not just black, but people of color are not treated equally. And that after so many years, and he talked about the civil rights movement. I mean, Donovan was, was an activist before he was the reason for an action. And Mr. Rand, as you know, uh, the Columbus Inspector General is now opening a probe in this case. What would you like to see as a result? I mean, we ask this question all too often because really, in many cases, there is no such thing as justice after you've lost your child. But what would justice, in quotes, uh, look like and mean to you at this point? First of all, the, the officer would be fired in jail, never be able ever in life to to perform any type of duties as an officer anywhere in the world. Officer Anderson's attorney released a statement that reads in part, uh, when we analyze police involved shootings, we must look to the totality of the circumstances. We are expressing forbidden, we are expressly forbidden from using 2020 hindsight because unlike all of us, officers are not afforded the luxury of armchair reflection when they are faced with rapidly evolving, volatile encounters in dangerous situations. Uh, I'm curious, Mr. Ann, if you could speak to Officer Anderson directly, what would you say to him? I, I'm, I, I'm at a loss for words. I, 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 I mean, I, I, I believe in forgiveness for your own health, but at this moment, I'm not there yet. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there's nothing nice that I have to say. Mr. Elliott, uh, Ms. Duran, we, we thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. We appreciate the time very much. Thank you very much. Columbus, Ohio has been at the center of many similar cases disproportionately involving black men. According to police data obtained by the Columbus Dispatch, there have been at least 62 shootings involving Columbus police officers since 2018. Of those, at least 19 have resulted in deaths. Still ahead here on Prime, heading back to class after a tragedy, the survivors of other school shootings are coming together to help Uvalde students find a way forward. Their words of encouragement. The warning from the FBI about ransomware attacks that could be targeted in your child's school. She is one of the greatest athletes to ever grace the hard court. We look at retiring WNBA player Sue Bird's standout stats by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Tom Cruise promoting yet another Mission Impossible, this time hanging from a plane. <laughs> All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 
Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom! Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. The Las Vegas Aces beat the Seattle Storm last night to advance to this year's WNBA Finals. But the big story was the retirement of one of the greats in the WNBA. Here's Sue Bird by the numbers. The Long Island-born sharpshooter won two NCAA titles at UConn, leading the Huskies to a remarkable 114-4 and record before being selected number one overall by the Storm in the 2002 draft. During two decades as a pro, Bird became the winningest WNBA player ever ever, notching 333 regular season victories. She collected four WNBA championships with the Storm and was named an All-Star a record 13 times. Bird also dropped dimes with 3,234 career assists, putting the point guard head and shoulders above her nearest competitor. She is an international superstar, collecting five straight Olympic gold medals for Team USA and five EuroLeague championships as well. Off the court, the 41-year-old is one half of one of the biggest power couples in sports, the fiancé to soccer superstar Megan Rapino, and a powerful advocate for LGBTQ equality. Rapino paid tribute on Instagram, calling Bird simply the greatest to ever do it. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight, including news about another retired basketball player, the multi-million dollar reason Michael Jordan is back in the headlines again. From nearly bare shelves to big discounts, why some stores are now offering big deals ahead of the holiday season. But first, we'll look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen She's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms.
Several states in the West are baking under a blistering heat wave that continues to fan the flames of several destructive wildfires in the region. In Southern California, thousands in Hammett told to get to safety as the fast-moving and aggressive Fairview fire tears through more than 7,000 acres. Officials concerned that number could skyrocket. The fire, 5% contained and proving fatal, killing two people and destroying multiple homes. Firefighters battling more deadly flames further north, the mountain fire burning more than 11,000 acres. While in San Bernardino, the Radford fire is only 2% contained with evacuation also underway. The fires fueled by strong winds and record-breaking heat. Some schools in Fresno with no air conditioning. Temperatures inside classrooms reaching 90 degrees. Children suffering throughout the day. The brutal temperatures putting pressure on California's electrical grid, leading to growing fears of power outages. Police in Tennessee for the first time released surveillance video of a mass shooting that took place inside a Kroger grocery store last year. The shooting in Collierville, Tennessee on September 23rd, 2021 left one person dead plus the gunman and 15 others injured. The video shows the moments leading up to the shooting where suspected gunman UK Thang first pulled up to the store, as well as the harrowing moments inside when Thang began shooting throughout the store and customers ran for safety. Thang had previously worked in that Kroger. A Michigan judge has struck down the state's 1931 law criminalizing most abortions, a major win for pro-abortion rights advocates. Judge Elizabeth Gleitcher said banning women from having abortions would violate the state's constitution. The law would have banned abortions in all cases except when the mother's life would be in danger. The ruling comes as Michigan's Supreme Court is deciding whether to place a proposed amendment solidifying abortion rights in the state on the ballot in the November election. Federal officials are urging schools to be on alert for ransomware attacks. The FBI and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency said attacks could increase as the school year begins and ransomware groups see new opportunities. And a major attack has already happened. The Los Angeles Unified School District, one of the largest in the country, fell victim over the weekend. Officials said smaller school districts are more vulnerable with fewer resources to prevent an attack. Officials releasing more information about the victim of a shark attack in the Bahamas. Caroline de Placido from Lake Erie, Pennsylvania, was on vacation with her family when she was attacked by a bull shark while snorkeling. Family members and tour operators tried to save de Placido, who suffered severe injuries to her left side in the attack. She was remembered as a popular faculty member at Gannon University. Long before he became an NBA legend, Michael Jordan made his NBA debut on October 26th, 1984. Now for the right price, you can own a pair of the tickets from that game against the Washington Bullets. Bonham's Auction House is listing the tickets along with other sports memorabilia and says the tickets are likely worth between $200,000 and $300,000. The owner was a high school junior at the time who wanted to see the team's newest draft pick in February a different ticket from the same game sold for $468,000. MJ had 16 points that night and the Bulls win the first of many. The auction runs from September 19th through the 29th. It's become a grim, growing club of sorts. Survivors of school shootings, once considered an anomaly, school shootings have become what feels like a regular school year occurrence. From Columbine to Uvalde, the faces change, but the pain and trauma do not. Our Maria Villarreal spoke with survivors and family members of victims of mass shootings about the day their life changed, but also the moments of happiness that do return in time. Well, Keith, I'm here on the Virginia Tech campus, just um, over at the drill field. This is about uh, from about an hour to an hour and a half ago. I remember hearing what became gunshots really in the hallway the second, you know, prior to the to the attack, and just how quickly the sound moved closer and closer to us. To see many of these parents reunited with their children, crying, walking down the street, and the fact that you realize that some of those parents will never get that moment again. Absolutely heartbreaking. I was in New York, and I got a phone call from my husband. Went in there, it was a beautiful day. It was sunny, it was upbeat, positive, and 
vibrant. Uh, this is the Denver Rocky Mountain News, where the word simply is horror, and that really says it all. The Denver Post, high school massacre, Columbine, bloodbath. I was 14 years old sitting in math class, and we heard loud noises, and we thought that it was somebody banging on the lockers. Just so many people really hurting and trying to process what happened here at Saugus High School. We were all talking about the Spanish test we had later that day, arguing about who would do better. And then we heard a bang. I was a bus driver that day. Technically, I was on the clock. When everything happened, I remember rolling into the high school in my bus, and it was like fire, police, helicopters. Sometimes we get these No matter how much time has passed, the heartbreak and lasting impact of a school shooting radiates through every community long after the last shot is fired. Memories ingrained in the minds of survivors. In May 2018, my daughter Kimberly Vaughn, she was one of the first kids that was shot and she died like instantly. Shots were fired at 7.45, 7.50 and it was like 5 p.m. Yeah, so that's 10 hours. Four years ago, Rhonda became a member of a club of grieving survivors that seems to be growing larger each year. The most notable in April of 1999. My name is Missy Mendo. I am from Littleton, Colorado. I am a Columbine High School survivor, and it has been 23 years since my shooting. My name is Christina Anderson Froling. I grew up on the East Coast in Virginia, and uh, when I was 19 years old, I became one of the injured survivors of a school shooting that happened on our campus at Virginia Tech in April of 2007. My name is Linda Beagle Shulman. My son is Scott Beagle, and we're talking about the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, February 14, 2018. My name is Mia Tretta. I live in Santa Clarita, California. I'm 17 years old, and when I was 15, I was shot in the Saugus High School shooting. It's been almost three years. The club hosts a network of survivors embarking on a long journey towards healing, both physically and mentally. The first few months after the shooting, I kept expecting that um, I was going to pick her up from Girl Scout camp, and I just kept thinking, like, she'll be back, like, any day now. You know, and that didn't happen. I now know it was a survivor's guilt. I felt like a hug from other survivors was totally different than a hug from somebody trying to console me. And specifically with my parents, I felt guilty in receiving those hugs. In kind of normal day-to-day -day tasks, I think for me personally, the biggest impact that the Virginia Tech shooting has had is disrupting my sense of, of safety and security. You are at a birthday party and someone accidentally pops a balloon and that brings you back, or a loud noise in a classroom when someone drops a book. And what were you going through? What And, and for that matter, what do you think Uvalde parents are going through? I call it the blur, where your body physically hurts, because mine did, like my chest hurt for like months, where they said that poor man had a heart attack after he learned that his wife died. I remember feeling that, just like constant ache. Um, you're crying all the time, you're not sleeping, you're, you don't know if you're eating. That's the blur. That's the blur. I had nightmares for a very long time, I still do. Here I am 23 years later, and I still very much battle with sleep. There were many mornings where I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Thinking about that, I'm never going to see my son ever again, because I think that, as silly as it sounds, psychologically, I've still not swallowed that I'm never going to see my son again. Something that I'm currently going through that I have a very, very hard time with is dropping my daughter off to school. It's hard, but I also think it would be equally as hard but in a different way if I went to a new school because no one understands. It was difficult seeing empty, um, empty desks, empty spaces, empty areas where somebody should have been standing and weren't with us anymore. Like, I still am fearful that I'm going to lose my kid, my other kid. 
and I'll be damned if I'm losing another kid. You have that fear. Oh yeah, constant fear. Does it get better? Yes and no. It gets more manageable, but it never goes away. I think to students that are that are coming back or may have to face something in, in the future, it's that you are very brave to come back in the first place and that you are embarking on, unfortunately, a very long journey. One day when you're thinking about your loved one, instead of the tears pouring out your eyes, you're going to smile. And when somebody shares something about your loved one, you're going to smile. Be patient. It's OK to heal at a different pace than someone else. One foot in front of the other, one minute at a time, one moment at a time, one day at a time. Keep going. Be strong. You are strong and you are resilient. Our thanks to Maria for that. Bargain shopping, anyone? Big box retailers like Walmart and Target are de and department stores like Nordstrom and Macy's are now cutting prices. The result of consumer trends is unexpectedly shifting as the world emerges from the pandemic. This is the result of too many unwanted items on store shelves. For the consumer, that translates to sales. So if there's something that you've been eager to buy, now is the time. Edward Enninful first hit the headlines when he became editor-in-chief of British Vogue more than two years ago, making him the first gay black male at the helm of the magazine. Since then, he has become one of the most recognizable faces in fashion, leading the way toward a more diverse and inclusive future. Edward opens up about his life in his new book, A Visible Man, a memoir, which chronicles his career rise and achievements within the fashion industry, from arriving in London as a refugee from Ghana to being a teenage model, to becoming one of the most influential figures in fashion. And joining us now is the man himself, Edward Enninful, author of A Visible Man. Thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure. I, I would like hoping that my outfit and everything is OK. You know, <laughs> it's I'm not the most, it's I'm good. Not, I'm not such a fashion person, but, you know, it's a little you bit intimidating great. to be here with you. So tell me why you felt that, that now was the right time to, to write this memoir. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm such a forward-looking person, you know, I'm always thinking of what's next. Mm -hmm. But of course, I hit 50, you know, I'd be the British folk for five years. We were in, in a pandemic, so it felt like, OK, I've got a little time on my hands. And also, I really wanted to show the next generation that, you know, when you see people like yourself, myself, there's a, there's a story behind it. We didn't just appear here, you know, and this whole, you know, just inclusivity really means a lot to me. And I wanted to talk about that as well. In the book. And, and let's start out in Ghana. Your mom uh, worked in fashion and, and how that ultimately shaped your passion and, and love for the industry. I mean, my mother was a great seamstress and she had an atelier with women coming in of all different shapes, sizes. You know, I loved beauty from that age, beauty in all its forms. So that really shaped me. And then when we moved to London, I slowly sort of, I was discovered on a train and then I started moving up in the fashion industry. And I'd always believed in diversity. I, I really believe that all women should be seen in the magazine. So that's really been at the backbone of my career. And you talk a lot about that idea of, of diversity and really working primarily in in white spaces mm -hmm. initially and having this imposter syndrome. Yes. And you're right, and I just want to quote, you said, it was an ego boost for me and a relief to my colleagues that I could take so much on my shoulders, but it had an adverse effect on my mind and soul. Tell me about what that adverse effect was and how you ultimately overcame or are perhaps even still overcoming <laughs> uh, the imposter syndrome. Yes. I mean, you know, I was on fashion director for ID magazine when I was 18 years old. And as you said, you know, I came from a family of refugees. We arrived penniless. So it was instilled in me, work twice as hard. Mm. You know, work 10 times as hard if you needed to. So I would work days and nights in the fashion industry. At the expense of my mental health, at the expense of, you know, a relationship, because this was what I've been taught my whole life. So I'm also curious, because you have been applauded for your inclusivity, mm -hmm. for your diversity uh, that you bring to the covers of, of British Vogue magazine. And so how do you incorporate race and culture and politics when it comes to beauty and fashion? I mean, like I said, you know, I grew up with my mother just in love with beauty in all its form. I saw that, you know, when I started at British Vogue in 2017, I looked around the world and thought, 
We need to represent everyone. We need to represent women of all races, black women especially, women of all ages, women of all sizes, religion. So I've had, you know, hijabs on the cover. I've really thought we have to show the world as it is. And really, that's all I did, you know. And I'm glad that the world received it so well. What do you think made the world finally ready to receive it? Because we're just talking about inside of the last decade, maybe even the last five, last years, five years, that yes. we're starting to see that kind of representation. I think, you know, for so long, fashion had been so removed from the world. Fashion had been this exclusive sort of society. And when I said, you know, all right, we're going to just change that. We're going to welcome all women. I wanted every woman to see themselves on the pages of Vogue. I always grew up with the line, if you can see it, you can be it. Mm -hmm. So really, for me, there was no other way but to have welcome women into the pages of, of Vogue, women you know, who, who you wouldn't normally see. When and you were a young man, did you anticipate that you would reach these heights? Not at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, when when you tell someone who has had to flee from their homeland to a new land that anything is possible, they, they can't really believe it because you've lost a home. Mm -hmm. But all I know is that hard work and grit and determination, you know, just really got me here. Not saying no, you know. What did you learn from writing this book? What I learned from writing this book was that I was quite resilient, that I was quite fearless, but also that maybe I should have taken time for myself, and more time for myself. But I was so young when I was working in the industry. And when you're that age, you just want to go. You know, you don't really, you can't really say no to people. And lastly, what would you hope that your readers will take away from your book? I just hope that my, you know, people reading will know that, you know, you can change an industry from within. For me, the book is for anybody who's suffering, who's dealing with mental issues, who's dealing with imposter syndrome, you know, all women, you know, that there's a way forward. I, was like, I always say, if I can do it, if I'm sitting here talking to you today, most people can do it, because I wasn't supposed to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your Thank time. Thank you so much for having me. A Visible Man, a memoir, is now available to buy wherever books are sold by Edward and in full. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, Francis Tiafo celebrating. Look at that smile after he becomes the first African-American man to reach a U.S. Open semifinal since Arthur Ashe did it back in 1972. He did it on the court named after Arthur Ashe. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. The citywide teacher strike in Seattle, the first day of classes delayed for some 50,000 students. What those teachers are fighting for. And the Osbournes are back. Ozzy and Sharon once again in the spotlight as the former first family of reality TV opens up about the rockers' health battle and what's next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download Load it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little
little nice Jewish boy, is 5'7", is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital, and then I just see Shimani is... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The high-profile trial for the leaders of the Oath Keepers extremist group will proceed this month after a judge rejected a last-minute bid by Stuart Rhodes to replace his lawyers and delay his prosecution. Rhodes claimed his attorneys weren't defending him forcefully enough in the Capitol riot case. His new lawyer argued that he had not been given enough time to adequately prepare and urged the judge to delay his trial at least 90 days. In Texas, a federal judge ruled a requirement under Obamacare that private insurance plans cover drugs that prevent various infections at no cost to patients violate both federal and constitutional law. The legal challenge was filed in 2020 and argued that the free coverage requirements for PrEP, contraceptives, and the HPV vaccine requires business owners to pay for services that, quote, encourage homosexual behavior, prostitution, sexual promiscuity, and intravenous drug use despite their religious beliefs. The American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network said in a statement that the ruling could threaten free preventative care more broadly, including routine cancer screenings. And the first day of classes that they were canceled in Seattle as hundreds of public school teachers walked off the job. Educators in the citywide strike are seeking better pay, mental health support, and improved staffing ratios for special education and multilingual students. The teachers union said in a statement they are negotiating with the school district to reach a contract agreement to get back in the classroom, quote, as fast as possible. There are about 50,000 students there affected. Next to the extreme fire danger and record heat on the West Coast and a near power disaster averted. Tonight, California's governor is calling the never before seen prolonged September heat a wake up call on climate change. Some relief could be on the way. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is standing by, but Will Carr reports from the fire lines. Tonight, thousands of firefighters battling flames spreading in record breaking heat across the state of California. In Riverside County, east of Los Angeles, the Fairview fire doubling in size in just 24 hours. You can hear the planes overhead with that thick plume of smoke growing. The fire already raced through this canyon, destroying everything in its path. The fire already claiming two lives. Authorities believe that people died in their car trying to escape. North of here, the Radford fire also out of control. This is what is saving Big Bear. It's the DC-10s and the tankers dropping the retardant nonstop. The fire's driven by drought and an unprecedented heat wave that's now in its eighth day, straining the state's power grid to its absolute limits, rolling blackouts a threat. In the Central Valley, several Fresno Unified schools having issues with their air conditioning, one even dismissing early Tuesday. I could not focus. I took like probably like 10 minutes to like think for like a couple problems. And in the Phoenix area, authorities rescuing multiple hikers in the extreme heat. Tragically, 32-year-old Evan Deshawn did not survive. I would just ask people to please be careful on the trails. He leaves behind a wife and infant daughter. Experts say prolonged, record-breaking heat waves like we're seeing in the West are becoming the new normal. Longer, hotter summers around the world thanks to our warming climate. Things have changed. Mother Nature's fury is now here and it's present. Will Carr joins us now from near the Fairview fire lines in Southern California. Will, while the power grid did hold last night, how much concern is there still about the tonight and, and the days ahead? Lindsay, there's real concern, and as that smoke is billowing behind me, uh, we know scorching temperatures are going to continue to fuel these fires and to challenge the power grid through the rest of the week. Tonight, authorities here in California are begging for consumers to conserve their energy to avoid rolling blackouts. Lindsay. All right. Will Carr, our thanks to you. Now let's bring in our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, in Anaheim, California, who is tracking it all. Hey, Ginger. 
Oh, we are baking here in Southern California, that's for sure, Lindsay. I do also want to mention Salt Lake City, for example, broke their all-time September record just yesterday at 105. They today are already at 107, which ties an all-time heat record for any month. This is a really big heat wave, and we are kind of at the crux of it. It's going to go down from here, but we've got 14 states that are on alert with some sort of fire or heat advisory, excessive heat warning still in place from Southern Nevada right here in California. What, what's going to happen is there are a couple of things going to come down. A cold front for the Pacific Northwest that will move through the Rockies, but then down here, we're going to see those numbers from 100, 101 on Friday in Los Angeles drop below 80 for the weekend. Some of that is going to come from moisture and cloud cover from a now Hurricane K that will be dwindling to a tropical storm, but close enough to land here where we could see some of those outer bands and certainly the cloud cover from it build moisture into Southern California, which we desperately need here. But what's going to happen on top of this is in some of those Palm Springs or Mount Laguna, uh, El Centro, you could end up with three to five inches of rain falling really quickly. And we know what happens when that comes down. Flash flood threat goes up. Lindsay? Uh, lots of concern there. Ginger, our thanks to you as always. Former President Trump ally Steve Bannon is expected to turn himself into authorities here in New York City tomorrow. He'll face state charges tied to allegations of fraud, and this time he'll do it without the help of a presidential pardon. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, Donald Trump's former advisor, Steve Bannon, preparing to surrender to law enforcement authorities here in New York. Bannon expected to face new charges in connection with a group called We Build the Wall, which raised $25 million to build a section of President Trump's border wall, much of that money coming from small donors. They see that this is a way uh, that they can take action to actually, you know, make happen a physical barrier on the southern border and support President Trump and, and what President Trump's trying to do. The group promised each donor an actual brick in the wall with their name on it. You're not going to last forever, but your brick will. Organizers pledging every penny raised would go towards construction. 100% of your money goes towards the wall. It's not going to lie in someone's pocket. But it wasn't true. In 2020, the Justice Department charged Bannon and three colleagues with pocketing hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations, spending it on themselves. But before Bannon's trial could even begin, President Trump threw him a lifeline, pardoning him on his very last day in office. Bannon's associates weren't so lucky. Two are facing years in prison after pleading guilty to wire fraud and conspiracy, and the third will soon be going on trial. Our thanks to Ariel Reshef. Now to the controversy in Columbus, Ohio, over a deadly police shooting. Columbus officials say that officers showed up at Donovan Lewis's apartment around 2 a.m. on August 30th to arrest him on several charges. Body camera video shows officers identifying themselves at the door and the two people leaving. Officers then enter with a canine and open a bedroom door, spotting 20-year-old Donovan Lewis sitting up in his bed and raising his hands. Officer Ricky Anderson appears to open fire almost immediately, firing a single shot. The Columbus police chief says it appeared Lewis was holding something in his hand, but no weapon was found at the scene, just a vape pen. Officer Anderson is on paid leave pending an investigation. Lewis's mother, Rebecca Duran, and the family's attorney, Rex Elliott, are joining us now exclusively tonight on ABC News Live Prime. Uh, thank you both for being here. And, and Ms. Duran, we want to obviously extend our, our condolences uh, to you, and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. We just went through the police department's explanation about what happened, including the second that it took for an officer to fire his gun killing your son. What's your response to their version of events? There is things that are absolutely untrue. The, um, and, and when you watch the, the, the complete video, it's, it's obvious. Um, the person that, the, the officer that shot him, it, it, it also in the video, it's absolutely obvious that he could not see him. He was partially behind the door and when he went to go shoot him, um, the person who had a, a, a clear view did, did not fire. So there's obviously something very, very, very wrong. Um, I mean, there's so much more. I, the fact that there was a delay of care, that there was no attempt to, 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 pre to preserve his life. Um, frisking him handcuffed, flipping him around on the bed. I work in healthcare, like there was no pressure applied to wounds. 
uh, he should have been treated immediately in that room. You saw the video, uh, apparently. Did you watch it immediately? I know that, that some mothers in the situation decide to not ever watch. Was there something that, that compelled you that, that you had to see his final moments? I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, and so I had to see for myself. I have not watched the entire video. Um, I have seen snippets. Um, trusted friends have sent me pieces and parts that none of it is okay, but that I don't have to see the worst treatment of him. I mean, there were six minutes that passed from the moment he was shot before first aid, the first attempt at any kind of aid was given. He was gone. Um, seeing when they said he was resisting, resi resi I am so sorry. I've not been sleeping. Oh, we resi understand. Please don't apologize. Resisting arrest, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, he was limp. He, 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 his own body weight is what they were fighting against. Not, it was no muscular contraction in there. I mean, it was his own body weight. If he was able to speak, he would have said something, help me something. Um, I'm smiling just because I'm thinking about how he talked. Mm -hmm. But if he was capable of talking, he would have. Mm -hmm. In cases like this, people are often remembered for how they died. I'm curious how you want people to remember Donovan for how he lived. He lived life grand. I mean, um, he loved life. He had a zest for life. He loved people. He had the biggest heart. Um, the people that have reached out to me, uh, teachers, coaches, a host of, of people throughout his life, his friends, um, all talk about his, his awesome sense of humor, his awesome smile, his beautiful eyelashes, you know, um, how much he cared about those were there around him. Uh, Mr. Elliott, uh, officers are saying that they waited several minutes at the front door and the bedroom door before entering. There's also their assertion that the officer believed that he was armed. From a legal standpoint, what do you think that officers could or should have done instead? Well, we first have to start with the fact that this arrest warrant was served in the middle of the night, which is a massive problem. There was no reason to serve this in the middle of the night and create the chaos that they did. Secondly, there was no reason for an attack dog to be in that apartment. The other two residents in the department in the apartment came to the door and let the officers in. But additionally, Donovan was in the back of the apartment. There's no indication that he heard anybody at the front door. And the, the reality is that this police officer opened the door and within a split second, he didn't have the time to perceive anything in Donovan's hand. Uh, Donovan, from the videos, uh, his hands were down to, at his side. Th these police officers were screaming at him to come out of the room. He's getting out of bed like they are asking him to do. He's following police commands when he is gunned down in cold blood. There was no indication on this video uh, that there was anything in his hand or any reason for this officer to use deadly force. You're filing a civil case against the city and Officer Anderson on behalf of the family. Can you tell us anything about the allegations that it might entail? Yeah, absolutely. It's a civil rights violation. It's a it's a it's excessive force. They used deadly force in a situation where deadly force was not called for. It was a reckless shooting. Mr. Rand, do you feel that that race played a role here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Donovan himself, uh, he wrote some journals that uh, <laughs> At a later date, I'll, I'll release them. He, in his own words, he was very, very adamant that people of color, he, he stressed that people of color, not just black, but people of color are not treated equally. And that after so many years, and he talked about the civil rights movement. I mean, Donovan was, was an activist before he was the reason for an action. And Mr. Rand, as you know, uh, the Columbus Inspector General is now opening a probe in this case. What would you like to see as a result? I mean, we ask this question all too often because really, in many cases, there is no such thing as justice after you've lost your child. But what would justice, in quotes, uh, look like and mean to you at this point? First of all, the, the officer would be fired in jail 
never be able ever in life to to perform any type of duties as an officer anywhere in the world. Officer Anderson's attorney released a statement that reads in part, uh, when we analyze police involved shootings, we must look to the totality of the circumstances. We are expressing forbidden, we are expressly forbidden from using 2020 hindsight because unlike all of us, officers are not afforded the luxury of armchair reflection when they are faced with rapidly evolving, volatile encounters in dangerous situations. Uh, I'm curious, Ms. Duran, if you could speak to Officer Anderson directly, what would you say to him? I, I'm, I, I'm at a loss for words. I, 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 I mean, I, I, I believe in forgiveness for your own health, but at this moment, I'm not there yet. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there's nothing nice that I have to say. Mr. Elliott, uh, Ms. Duran, we, we thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. We appreciate the time very much. Thank you very much. Columbus, Ohio has been at the center of many similar cases disproportionately involving black men, according to police data obtained by the Columbus Dispatch. There have been at least 62 shootings involving Columbus police officers since 2018. Of those, at least 19 have resulted in deaths. Now to the scene at the White House today where the Obamas returned together for the first time since leaving 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue back in 2017. They were there for the unveiling of their official White House portraits, bringing back a tradition that was skipped during the Trump administration. So what did they have to say after more than five years away? Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama returned to the White House together for the first time since they moved out in 2017. Barack and Michelle, welcome home. <laughs> welcome home. The Obamas on hand for the unveiling of their official portraits. The former president rendered in hyper-realistic detail by artist Robert McCurdy. You'll note that he refused to hide any of my gray hairs. <laughs> Refused my request to make my ears smaller. <laughs> but then, on a more personal note... When future generations walk these halls and look up at these portraits, I hope they get a better, honest sense of who Michelle and I were. And I hope they leave with a deeper understanding that if we could make it here, maybe they can too. The former First Lady also nodding to history. A girl like me... She was never supposed to be up there next to Jacqueline Kenny, Kennedy and Dolly Madison. Uh, she was never supposed to live in this house, and she definitely wasn't supposed to serve as First Lady. Presidents usually host their predecessors for their portrait unveiling, but former President Donald Trump did not. Tonight, Michelle Obama insisting traditions like this matter. You see, the people, they make their voices heard with their vote. We hold an inauguration to ensure a peaceful transition of power. And once our time is up, we move on. And all that remains in this hallowed place are our good efforts and these portraits. Lindsay, as the nation's first and only black president and first lady, the Obama said that these portraits will tell a fuller American story and send a message that everyone has a place in this country. Lindsay. Our thanks to Rachel for that. And still to come, a desperate search through the mud for survivors after a deadly mudslide. And they're one of the first families of reality TV. Sharon and Ozzy Osbourne talk about a new show and the rock legend's new album. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. We are tracking several headlines around the world. At least 15 people died in western Uganda after their homes were buried in a landslide triggered by torrential rains. As emergency workers shoveled through mud in search of survivors, most of those killed were women and children, according to the Red Cross. After a prolonged drought, heavy rains have fallen on much of Uganda since late July, causing deaths and flooding and the destruction of crops, homes, and infrastructure. Tanks pounded targets and fighter jets roared overhead as Taiwan's military showed off in its latest combat drills after weeks of being rattled by neighboring China. China, which claims democratically ruled Taiwan as its own territory, has been carrying out exercises around the island since a visit to Taipei last month by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Brazilians celebrated their bicentennial Independence Day with less than a month until presidential elections. President Bolsonaro, a far-right nationalist seeking re-election, participated in a military parade in Brasilia and Rio de Janeiro, turning a national holiday into one of his latest campaign stunts. During his speech, Bolsonaro defended the criminalization of abortion and statements against gender identity. Legends in rock and roll, reality TV, and talk show Sharon and Ozzy Osbourne are looking to the future with a new show and a new album. In their first interview since a major operation for Ozzy, the couple sat down with our Chris Connolly for an ABC News exclusive to discuss what still lies ahead. This is what Ozzy Osbourne does best. When I get on a stage, something takes over. My spirit becomes alive. And at 73, Ozzy taking that stage last month for the first time in more than two years, closing the Commonwealth Games in his hometown of Birmingham, England. There was 30,000 people there, and as soon as Ozzy came up, they were all crying because they just couldn't believe that there. he was there. <laughs> Shut up. One of those moments that you just don't forget. It was just, a, my life's been incredible. From the Prince of Darkness with Black Sabbath and solo rock stardom to a reality TV OG with the Osbournes, that life precious as ever. In January 2020, Ozzy and Sharon Osbourne revealing his health struggles to Robin Roberts. I did my last show, New Year's Eve, at sort the Forum. Then I had a bad fall. I had to have surgery on my neck which screwed all my nerves in. And I found out that I have a, 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 a mild form of a small body. It's um, Parkin 2. Parkin 2 is a gene which is known to cause early onset Parkinson's. Today, Ozzy's Parkinson's is still slowly progressing. That fall, however, and the surgery in the aftermath has been a major issue, but Ozzy's staying strong. How's your mobility these days? Not great. But I, I mean, I have to uh, negotiate everywhere I'm going to go, you know. And I tire easily. But I'm well. My family have been absolutely wonderful while I've been laid up. How's that been for you, Sharon? He's a pain in the butt. Everything from heartbreaking to soul destroying to joys of his getting better. Ozzy undergoing another operation in June to address his excruciating pain. These metal plates were working their way out. The debris was rubbing on his spinal cord. He would literally be crying in pain some days. Before, I would be talking to you. Like, and after this other surgery, I can hold my head up now. But I couldn't do that before. Seems to have the surgery. I've improved quite considerably. <laughs> It's
It's a new chapter for the Osbournes. Ozzy's new album, Patient Number no. 9, drops this week. Ozzy in full roar. What do you want your fans to know about how you are now and what you imagine going forward? Don't give up. When I retire, I'll, be, I'll, I'll hear the sound of soil going over my lid. <laughs> you ain't got to see the last of me yet. And Sharon, the subject of an upcoming docu-series that'll chronicle her eventful life, including her tumultuous March 2021 split from The Talk, after those fraught exchanges with co-host Cheryl Underwood, while Sharon was defending longtime friend Piers Morgan. Everybody goes, if you support him, then you must be racist because he's racist. As you look back on that time now, what sort of things come to mind? An education and um, no regrets, no more saying sorry, because I'm not, because I didn't do anything wrong except ask questions. Now, after two decades plus in the American spotlight, they're returning to England. I read, Ozzy, that you wanted to leave Los Angeles because you were upset about all the shootings that have been taking place. It is alarming. The amount of drugs, school shootings and massacres. Do I feel safe living here without security? No. No way. Is that why you're moving back to the UK? One of the reasons, and two, I can't speak for Ozzy, but I want to go home. And with their children stateside, including son Jack and his four kids, daughter Kelly expecting this fall, it's more see you later than farewell, as they head to the UK and sell this house. If these hedges could talk, what would they say, Ozzy? Thank God they're going. <laughs> Our thanks to Chris. And still to come, high school football team is starting off the fall season with something you don't see very often, how they're kicking off change on the field. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award winning, powerful, eye opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Fall football is here, and high schools across the country are starting their seasons. And one high school team in Chicago is standing out. They are changing the face and future of football with eight young women on the roster. In tonight's local lowdown, reporter Will Jones from our partner station WLS introduces us to the trailblazing trio that kicked off this change on the field just a few years ago. In full gear, this looks like your average high school football team, but looks can be deceiving. When Gage Park High School alums Dominique Robinson, Janelle Marino, and Jemiah Cochran suited up last season for the Owls, they knew they had a lot to prove. Peers around me said that females couldn't play ball, so I had told my mom about it, then my mom and my grandma uh, encouraged me to play football. Hit football coach Michael Norwood recalls when they first approached him about trying out for the team. I was like, well, okay, fine, let's play football then. And then I didn't know they was going to come out and become, make an impact on the field. Don't judge a book by its cover, you know. They did better than some guys. But like all players, it took some time for them to find their stride. My first game, oh my goodness. My stomach was like, oh my, I don't even know. I used to be scared sometimes, like to hit, but then I got used to it. On game day last season, Norwood would give the opposing team's coaching staff a heads up about his atypical roster. I said, I got a few females on my team, and they look like, 
A shot? Go, 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 go. Drive, drive, beat, 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 beat. This season, the team has three female players on their squad. Ahead of their first game, wide receiver LaShonda Washington has already gained the respect of her teammates. I showed them that I can catch the ball, and I showed them that I can run it. And if any of their competitors see having female players as a disadvantage, the team has this to say. It's going to be good because we're going to show them why we got girls on our team. Ready, one. For this trailblazing trio, the more girls on the team, the better. For the females that do want to play sports, boys sports, go out there and show them that you're supposed to be there. Our thanks to Will Jones for that. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. We thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news.